Thank you all so much for joining us for episode eight, season four of our Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama. And we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. So, you know, one of the things that I like about research, and even theory, is <laughs> that it's so applicable. And I think that that's especially the case with communication research. And I know that we've talked about the different areas that scholars from our CNIS doctoral program can and have pursued and how that's pretty cool. And I also think that it's pretty cool the amount of people who we've talked to and I've thought like, oh, this is me. Like I use a second screen when I'm watching sports. Could you research me? Or <laughs> I have FOMO. Could you research me? Or as we'll talk about with today's guest, I create narratives in my head that actually impact, well, to be frank, my health. Could you research me? And <laughs> the only conclusion is that, you know, education is cool and learning about communication in all of the ways is beneficial. I had that exact same thought. Today's guest is Dr. Sky Cooley, who is currently an assistant professor at Oklahoma State University in the School of Media and Strategic Communications. Sky is also the founder of the Mesa Group, which is the Media Ecology and Strategic Analysis Group. And that's an interdisciplinary group that uses strategic narrative assessment as a tool for promoting cooperative assistance and creating community power. You're, you're you have to tune in. This is going to be so amazing. Um, and that's some of what we'll be talking about today. This is a really fun conversation. And I came away with it with a better understanding of myself and some added to these like practice mindfulness. Don't create a narrative in my head about how practicing <laughs> mindfulness will take time. And if I do it here, then this. And if I wait, then this. And see, okay, we're going to go back, insert biohack to be present now. There's much still to learn. And before we chase those narratives even more, welcome to Revise and Resubmit, Sky. Welcome, Sky. Thank you all so much. Episode 9, Season 4 of our Revise podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama. And we both work in the Institute of... Uh, that's okay. That's okay. I actually, I lost you for a second, so it's better to probably start it over. Okay. Okay. Let me... <coughs> okay. Um, three, two, one. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sky. We are thrilled to be able to catch up with you. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So, Sky, before we jump into this conversation about who you are and what you've been doing, I have to ask you a question or two maybe three, but I'll try to keep it one or two about the Winter Olympics. If I remember correctly, mm. you spent a little bit of time in Sochi covering the Winter Games in 2014, which means you've had an opportunity to see them in person and then watch them on air. So I got to know, what, what sport do you like watching? Or was there a favorite sport that you liked covering? Hmm. I, I, I loved being at the Winter Olympics. I'd never um, had a chance to, to go to any of the events. And really, the Olympics were not something that was huge on my radar until I got a chance to, to, to experience it. My wife is Russian. And then just sort of on, on a whim, we were like, hey, we should uh, try to be uh, a volunteer and work at the uh, Winter Olympic Games. And so I submitted an application for uh, a volunteer role. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. They started looking at my credentials and I ended up working um, uh, in the in the media outlets and got to do a lot of the coverage. I think the most fun in person 
is the ski jump. Uh, you don't really <laughs> realize how ridiculously difficult that is watching it on TV <laughs> or scary, right? Like, scary, you be, right. You have to be like, uh, you know, quasi crazy to do it. It's really, <laughs> uh, it's really dangerous. Uh, and then, but what I remember the most about, uh, about the Olympics and the athletes at Sachi was uh, there were a few young women who, uh, some of the African countries that, you know, typically don't have a presence in winter sports, what they'll do is they'll, they'll find people that, you know, are in Italy who are pretty good skiers, whose grandparents or something were affiliated with, you know, that, that country. And so they'll kind of have a winter team, but it's normally relatively amateurish uh, type of uh, athletes, but they're out there competing against, you know, a, literally a, a Olympians. I mean, they're, they get the Olympic title. Uh, but the, the, the caliber of, of what they're capable of is a lot different. But getting to see them go through the experience, and I got mm -hmm. a chance to interview a few of them. And it was just really sweet and endearing how, you know, they thought of the moment and, and the stage. And so that amateur quality of the Olympics, really getting to see it in a lot of different facets, I, I found to be uh, really great. And then in the Olympic Village, people trade like these pins, you know, like from all over the world. And so it's like its own little form of currency. It's its own little culture and seen and some people have done it you know their whole lives they've just been going to them and, and it sort of becomes what they do as a, either a family or for the vacations they take and so it really did leave an impact on me and watching uh this year's winter olympic games uh, we're obviously watching some of the figure skating sadly that you have you know mm -hmm. the same scandals that have have plagued the olympics of late but um you know, watching the figure skating, watching, I love watching the downhill Alpine. I think those guys are, are, and, and women, I, I say that uh, men and women are, um, you know, just incredible athletes. Like that is so hard. Uh, yeah. they're, they're going down like a mile in like, you know, a few seconds you're going so fast. And, and my wife and I were like, you know, how long do you think it would take us to go down this track? Like, <laughs> like 10 minutes. Um, so I, I really do love it. I, I will say that I remember being there uh, when the invasion of Crimea happened. That happened in 2014. And so, you know, on a different, more serious note, seeing that we're in a very similar position to that again in these Olympic Games is, is disheartening. Um, I think that when you look at the kinds of frameworks we have uh, globally, uh, co even our, our most cooperative things – uh, are, are still competitive, right? Like the Olympics is still like this competition amongst nations. And, and so I look at it as, as this, you know, it's this great opportunity to come together, but it's still this competitive framework. And, and mm -hmm. I, I, I just long for a day that we've got a system that's more cooperatively geared. So that's my response. Well, I was hoping you were going to say curling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, like I've I've had a moment to think about about my my approach to sports and uh, <laughs> watching sports, and I think that as you mentioned this the alpine skiing, like I have to turn it off because it makes me like physically a little nervous mm -hmm. and like not seasick because I'm not on a sea, but the same kind of feeling, and I, I get a little like motion sickness curling and that doesn't happen there's no <laughs> yeah those the people that do that I've, i got uh, interestingly enough um at sachi i actually had a chance i had so many wild adventures out back in the in, in the middle of russia um during the olympics because you're there for so long mm -hmm. um but but i actually met some of the the people that do curling for both the u.s and canada at least the, the ones that did it in, in 2014 and they were just you know they were very regular regular people they did not come across to me as professional athletes it, it seemed a lot more like like drinking buddies that one thing led <laughs> to another and they were in the olympics <laughs> That's a have... lot of how the story was <laughs> so uh, guy can can you tell us where you are from or where you grew up yeah sure so i, I grew up in louisiana my family kind of dotted around uh, originally out from uh lake charles when i was a little bit older, my mom moved us out to uh, to Baton Rouge, and I really would say that I grew up um, mainly in uh, the Baton Rouge area, uh, and then went to LSU for my undergraduate degree and my master's degree. And when were you at the University of Alabama? I was at UA uh, 2008 through 2011, got two national championships in, in football <laughs> during that run. Uh, <laughs> the, our first year there, our first year there, uh, my wife and I, uh, Glenn Coffey was the running back. And I remember um, they gave Mark Ingram the ball at some point, And he, it was like he was exploded out of a cannon. 
and nobody could tackle it. And I was like, why, why isn't this guy getting the ball every single play? And then lo and behold, uh, you know, next year they, they win the national championship. So just a lot of wonderful um, memories uh, of just all that time was super fun. And then tell us where you are now. I am in Stillwater, Oklahoma at Oklahoma State University in the School of Media and Strategic Communications. All right, cool. So what did the young Sky think he would be doing when he was growing up? Because you're in academia now. We know that you kind of went the academic route. But did you always envision that for yourself when you were a young lad? No, 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 not at all. Um, Although I think that, like, you know, looking back, the idea of Indiana Jones always appealed to me. I didn't even realize that he was a professor. And now thinking like through the the job, it's like, oh, okay, actually that works well. Um, But I I think mostly I I had government intelligence in mind when I was going through school. Um, I always thought of myself as like tracking towards either maybe not James Bond, maybe more like a Chloe O'Brien kind of like (laughs) analyst kind of role or something like that. Um, but, but I always sort of thought of myself in, in those kinds of jobs and then kind of getting to the end of the PhD, sort of looking at what those jobs were interviewed for a few of those kinds of jobs and then just the lifestyle that, that it would take, where you would have to live, um, and, you know, being married and really looking at the time that I saw the academics, around me, what, what they were able to do and, and the lifestyles that they were able to carve out for themselves um, really started to appeal to me more and more. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that the more you're around the academic lifestyle and some of the freedoms there within both to pursue, you know, intellectually what you want to pursue uh, to make the kinds of impacts that you want to make. Um, and then just the time that you get that's your own to sort of develop and create is it's really hard to compete with that, I think. Very true. So I have to ask a follow up. Did the lovely, young, sweet, beautiful Indiana of yours, did she get her name because you were a fan of Indiana? <laughs> in, in part. There's also a couple <laughs> of other, there's a couple of other roll, roll-ins to that. My family has like this weird, bizarre history of naming people after places. Like for whatever reason, that's like canon now in our family. So <laughs> we've got like Denver, Dallas, Dakota. Sky is an island off the coast of Scotland. We've got Sydney, we've got Georgia, we've got Kansas. And so we had this pressure to name, uh, you know, our daughter some <laughs> uh, like a place, some kind of place, and then Indiana just really fit, and it fits her personality so much. Like Indipendi is what everybody calls her. Um, she's very autonomous and and sweet and fun, and it's so it's such a good name. But yes, Indiana Jones certainly factored into that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, can you uh, tell us uh, a little bit about your scholarship? So maybe like an elevator pitch on on what you're researching. Yeah, happily. Uh, so I am the co-founder of the Mesa Group. So we're the Media Ecology and Strategic Analysis uh, Group. We're a research group that has, um, I think we've got about eight faculty members that work with us. We've got a couple of different uh, data scientists type of consultants that work with us and a bunch of other um nonprofits uh, around both the U.S. and some some globally, actually. Um, and what we do is uh, we look at how the stories people tell about themselves um, influence their decisions in, in the real world, uh, how they limit or enable cooperative possibilities. Um, people have this tendency uh, to, to create these high strike dramas in their minds. And, and these things can get pretty divorced from the reality that's like directly in front of them. So a lot of the work that we do trains people to use uh, biohacks or biological hacks to you just overcome some of the innate biases and triggers of these, you know, persistent internal dramas. Catastrophic thinking. That's uh, that's mm-hmm. my. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's it's almost fifty percent of your waking moments are thinking about the past uh, or the future or or you're rolling tape on some kind of, you know, imaginary thing that you've created in your mind. Uh, it's just because you get the, the, the present can be boring and you, and you lose attention to it, but there, there are a lot of consequences of that attention loss. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to have to ask you to follow up a little bit on this because this sounds really fascinating. What are some of the things that you found with this area of study? That narratives hijack our biology. Uh, that's one. Um, oh. That there's this, there's a theory of ontological security and it's essentially like at a, at a fundamental level, stories are sense-making devices, narratives are, are sense-making tools. They give you a sequence 
of things, right? Like this happens and this happens. Think about a rom-com. Like, you know how that movie's going to end before you go into it. That's, that's part of the appeal. And there's this sense-making element of, of narratives that we rely on to, you know, perform our daily roles and our tasks. The problem is, is that we can embed certain types of roles and characters that are antagonistic towards one, one another or that are conflictual towards one another. Or I can be pursuing, uh, I can be thinking we're in a rom-com and you can be thinking that we're in a horror movie and we're going to act a lot differently <laughs> depending on uh, what, you know, you believe we're in at the moment. And, and that seems, and it is, and it is funny, but when we talk about like a globalized information environment where people are consuming individualized types of content um, and there's just so much information that you can't possibly have collective shared um, narratives, let alone uh, collective shared practices. So you get people who are, you know, they're, they're operating on different worldviews and different stories and different narrative trajectories, but they're able to interact and interconnect with one another because of all of our interconnectivity, Castell's network society, as it were. And so how do you, how do you reconcile that? And I think that where we've arrived at in our work is, you know, how do we bypass all this narrative bias without undercutting like who people think they are how can you get them to pay attention to who they are in the moment like the actual people around them and prioritize something other than performing role and so we spent a lot of time doing this in part because so much of our work has looked at um you know we we look at different countries and try to see how they're talking about an event to see where there might be overlap or where there might be contention Uh, And that can be very useful for uh, policymakers. And that's a lot of what we've done in our early work. Uh, And then, you know, as as you do that for years and years and years, you start thinking about like individual type of of treatments um, uh, to help enter, you know, to to help fix some of this, to help create a more cooperative um, environment that people are are working in. And so we we have three tracks of research now. Uh, We do narrative analysis where we really are overlaying different stories by different groups on a topic to try to find commonality of and divergence in the ontologies. Uh, and then we do coherence based uh, media literacy. So we're trying to teach people to prioritize what's happening to them biologically while they're consuming media, rather than just sort of passively absorbing the story, like paying attention when you're getting angry, why are you getting angry? Like notice those changes, notice the triggers. Um, so giving people like a biological anger and then transferring that over into the third track is, you know, teaching people to rely on biological coherence rather than narrative when they're in cooperative settings, particularly in media uh, settings. So looking at virtual uh, reality environments, um, augmented reality environments, Zoom types of conversations and trying to build teams that are working in these mediated spaces uh, that might be completely globally you know, disconnected geographically, but, but coming together to solve a problem or work together in the same you know, media space, trying to give them some, some hacks to try to create efficiencies to help them work better together, uh, find commonalities that are divorced from narrative. Okay, so many, 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 many things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do a lot of stuff. Uh, we have a lot of people that work with us now. I mean, really, so you get to do a lot of cool stuff. We were able to graft in people uh, that were that have different specialties, and so uh, we get to do a lot of cool stuff. I'm thinking, like, I had a I had an instructor once in undergrad. I was a political science major, and he and I had him for a couple of classes. He came in like the first day, and he said, "I am not myself throughout this class. I am going to be teaching as if I were some political figure." Mm, cool. And I'm, and I'm thinking, like, I should go into my classes and say, "All right." I am going to be in rom-com this semester and <laughs> I'm going to approach this class. And so, okay, that, that aside, tell us a little bit more about like what, what the biological outcome or impact can be. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, cool. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the things that so we do, I've worked uh, pretty extensively with um, with the military and in and, and, and different types of capacities. And um, when you when you look at misinformation. So for a long time, the military has been concerned with this idea of gray zone warfare, this, you know, and that's everything from cyber attacks. But it's also this information warfare where, you know, you really are playing on the fact that you, know, you have people that 
are in in a, a particular geographic region, like they're in the United States, but you know they think of themselves as another nationality, or they're in Ukraine, but they think of themselves as Russian, and sort of bombarding those information areas with with disinformation and misinformation. And we've seen it through the. I mean, I think everybody's more savvy to it now than they were five, six years ago. Um, but we've been in this space um, for a while, and one of the things that's that's really telling is this kind of this kind of information warfare that has specific impacts biologically on you. It, it's really good at activating these things called crisis emotions. So fear, rage, you know, like it, it, they're, they're designed intentionally to, to make you upset. And what happens is when when these crisis emotions hit the hit the body, it throws the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system out of whack. And that leads to what's measurably and they measure it by um, heart rate variability. Um, it, it throws you into a state of, of biological incoherence. It's like imagine in a car smashing on the gas pedal and smashing on the brake, smashing on the gas pedal. That your system's just jolting and 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 firing differently. And the impact of that is that it actually shuts down um, uh, some of the, your access to your higher brain function. So you get into this state called cortical inhibition in states of incoherence. And it's a, basically you're, you're operating almost on a primitive brain uh, type of setup where more like fight flight type of responses. So, you know, think about a person that, that has road rage, like they're not really thinking logically about what it is they're doing. And that's because their parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems are all out of whack. They don't have higher access, high access to their higher brain functions. And so they're, they're, they're acting just primal and literally like um, literally in the primal way. And so what we try to do is teach people how to get into states of biological coherence. And there's a couple of easy techniques. We're partnered with uh, the HeartMath Institute. Uh, the lead scientist there is Dr. Uh, Roland McCready. They do amazing work. Um, in fact, we, we thought we had had some unique approaches to this stuff. And then I met Roland and I was like, oh, wait a second. You guys have been doing this for 20 years. Cool. Can we work <laughs> with you? Uh, and so they've, they've given us and, and trained us in some of their techniques and then once people are able to kind of recognize what biological coherence feels like, and they uh, to train people, you wear this little um, this little device. HeartMath is called the EM Wave Pro or or the Inner Balance Trainer. They've got two, uh, but it, it'll it'll show you when you've got your, um, your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system are in align with one another. And there's a couple of easy ways to do it. Deep breathing does it. Um, if you focus on some positive emotions. You can see these type of measurable changes. Um, and the tech is really, really neat and people can learn it. It's, it's like, a, 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 like a scientific version of meditation. And um, once you teach people these coherent states, what we try to do is then put them into media environments, whether that be them working with another person in like a cooperative setup or whether that's just them exposed to um, uh, media content. And then show them demonstrably, okay, when you see this kind of, when you see misinformation, look what's happening to your coherence, right? Look at how it's putting you all in, in the red. Or when you get frustrated playing roles in a group, look what's happening to your coherence. And so we try to teach people like as a basic and a novel form of media literacy, how to prioritize individual and group coherence. And we've got a couple of really cool projects out uh, with uh, Carnegie, we've got uh, one out with uh, the Mercury Project and uh, a rural renewal is initiative here uh, in Oklahoma that we're we're, we're working on uh, these type of treatments and interventions. So uh, really cool work, and really proud that we've got the relationship that we've got with the HeartMath Institute. They're uh, they're really brilliant people and do incredible work. And so to get to be a small part of that is is quite rewarding. You know. I when you said smashing on the brakes and the gas at the same time, anyone, I imagine it's not me, who goes from driving a stick to an automatic <laughs> tries to, to use both feet um, because that's what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. I totally can like feel that inco I feel that incoherence and that's a, uh, I'm mm -hmm. I'm and, telling what you're speaking, and I like it. And, and the car analogy <laughs> holds uh, as well because the you can be in a coherent state while you're still, you know, while while you've still got a high level of it. It's not relaxation, mm -hmm. right? Like you 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 can train police officers in in these techniques where you know they're going into very high stress scenarios, but they're still able to be calm even though their heart rate's high. So you can drive a car 100 miles an hour and still hit the brake slowly and accelerate smoothly. 
Um, and you can be going 10 miles an hour. And I've tried to teach my Russian mother-in-law how to drive a car before one time <laughs> and we weren't going fast, but it was terrifying. Right. And so uh, it's, it's, it's about the biological system uh, and paying attention to that kind of like prioritizing that. And that to me is a way of getting past those traps of narrative. Um, it, it's at least one approach and that's the one that we've really pursued. This is just so, so fascinating. So I'm curious, shifting gears on you just a little bit, is this something that you're able to incorporate into the classes that you teach? Is this what you're, are you training students how to do this? Is your scholarship and teaching kind of separate? Can you give us information on that? Sure. So we, we cut our teeth doing really applied research, um, really applied stuff for the military. Um, we've worked with all kinds of different agencies, uh, DHS, DOD. We've worked with Borders Trade and Immigration, uh, Army Trade Doc. We rewrote the Strategic Command Doctrine for, for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, we worked with the, a bunch of different groups. And, and, and as we built capacity, we started getting students that were able to work with us, right? So we've got probably eight, nine students that work with us regularly now. And the more that we have done it and the more that we've sort of carved out a role and a niche and a certain sets of skills, it has started to, to roll into the classroom. I mostly teach methods. Like that's what I, I I'm, I'm the method person. I always have been everywhere I've, I've ever been. I just sort of get thrown in. And it's because I, I, I have had the opportunity when I was at LSU, I worked with Jinx Broussard. She was a historian. Um, I've worked with political scientists. I've done ethnography. Um, I've been a part of all kinds of different experimental designs. And so um, I, I, the expertise that I have is in methodology. I, I've, I've got firsthand experience with almost every kind that you could imagine. Uh, and I've got to work on, you know, stuff where we're doing huge, like we're on a project now where we've done depth interviews, but we've also done human in the loop AI training. And, and, and so bringing in big data and making sense of data is uh, something that our group does a lot of. And so I get to bring that into the classroom directly, even sometimes, you know, just using some of the direct examples so that students can see some of our data sets and work with them um, or see some of the questions that we're facing as, as a group and get their ideas about methodological approaches. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It really is. Uh, teaching methods uh, isn't typically people's, they don't always go in thinking it's going to be the most <laughs> exciting class. Uh, but I, I will say that, um, you know, I think that the students uh, in, in the methods class ha have a lot of fun. Now it's taken me a while to get it right, but um, yeah, I, think it's a, I think it's a fun class. They do get, they, you know, you get to see the application of research. Applied research is so fun. And once students realize that, wait a second, you can, you can go out and make a difference in the world doing this stuff. Okay, cool. I'll pay attention now. And I think that's the hook that, that we try to get them with is trying to show the applications of how theory gets translated into actual something on the ground. And that's, I think a big selling point. I mean, I, I as a, as a methodologist myself, when when I'm like hopping around in front of a classroom, like getting excited, I'm like, this is cool stuff, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it is cool. It really is. And you know, I, I also think that a lot of students don't like, you know, when they when they first try to think of a research project, they're they're trying to think about something either way too huge in scope um, mm -hmm. or something that they're so vested in that they're just producing knowledge for themselves. And, and you have to remember as a researcher that, you know, your, your job is to produce something that's, that's useful to somebody else, right? It's not right. just like your beef or your bent that you're trying to put out in the world. It's what are you creating that's actionable for people? And, and that mentality shift, it takes a little bit, but once students get it, in my experience, they really do get it and, and have a lot of fun with the projects they, that they're able to create. All right. So not to put you on the spot and they're, <laughs> May not be an editor here, but what is your favorite method? Ooh. Oh, well, you know, I'm a mixed methodologist. Everything that, well, I, my favorite methodology is, is a mixed method design. And, and I say that because I have, we've done so many projects. We, 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 we cut our teeth working with the SMA, the Strategic Multilayered Assessment Group in the Pentagon. And we worked with them for eight years and still do some work with them. And their whole thing, what they do is they take a question from uh, some kind of pressing question in, in the military. Um, it, it could be anything like the viability of uh, the Space Force, like the odds that a, a, a summit with North Korea is going to turn out good. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, Russian 
plans for the next 15 years in terms of all kinds of different questions. And then what they do is they take specialists from all over the United States and all over the world, really. Um, some are academics, some are in private industry, some are foreign military, and they all converge on this one question. So what you produce is it's not the final score. It's like you're like the, the, the free throw stat line. Like everybody contributes something. And then you look at this whole body of, of answers and you, are, you start to take away themes and you're able to look and see where interventions would be, you know, the most sensible, the most cost effective. And it really left an impression with me working with the SMA. And so uh, we have built the Mesa Group as like a much smaller, you know, housed in a university type product. Uh, or, or type group where, you know, we bring in, we have, uh, right now we have Dr. Jared Johnson, who is um, an in-depth interview specialist. And we've also worked with people like Dr. Robert Utterback and Pablo Aguilar, who are specialists in, in big data. And we, we work with both of them simultaneously on the same project, because I want to see what the big data says. I want to see what the, what kinds of trends and tracks can be done that way. But I also want to hear a person's voice crack you know, when they're talking about something that scared them. Uh, we worked mm -hmm. with, with, um, with migrants a lot, talking about the state collapse in the Northern Triangle for the uh, Department of Homeland Security, like, you know, looking at origin points, so solutions, like practical stuff. So we got to talk with a lot of policymakers, but we also got to track a lot of, of, of big data. But then we got to talk with actual migrants themselves. And, and I don't particularly speak Spanish, but I was in the room for all the interviews. And you could feel the fear and you could feel the heartache and like there's something about that that no matter what your computational analytics show you you're not getting that from it and so i, I to me the best approach is some kind of blend where you know you're, you're still talking to the the human being on the ground and whatever it is that you're looking at but then you've got some kind of macro zoom out mm. uh viewpoint and, and then being able to blend that in and even better if you can layer in media or if you can layer in policy as well. Wow. Love it. Absolutely. So we're going to shift gears on you again. We have so many, so many questions. We got to keep hopping. Um, when you were at the University of Alabama, you had an opportunity to overlap when Dr. Jennings Bryant was here. And I was wondering if you have a great Jennings story to tell mm -hmm. or you want to talk about a class that you took from him or anything like that? Sure. Um, I, I didn't have a, a ton of contact with Dr. Bryant. I mean, I saw him a lot. I remember him as a very jovial, happy presence. He would always say hi to me. And, and just like the legendary stories about him that everyone would tell. Um, my story for, for I was I got assigned to teach. Um, let me say that I view myself as a researcher and always have. And the teaching part has always been that thing that I sort of had to learn how to do. <laughs> and, um, and I remember my first class at UA was this, it was a big class. It was, it was like over a hundred people. I remember it was over a hundred people. It was like an, an intro class. And I, I was, and even thinking about it now, I was so nervous about it. So nervous to the point that I had to turn off the lights and everything, but the front row. So I could just see like the nine <laughs> people there instead of however many there were. Um, but thinking about like teaching that class, I just like, I, I didn't, I didn't want to do it. And, and so I went to Dr. Bryant. And I, and I had like a really detailed like argument as to why, you know, they should put me and do something else or just let me do research. <laughs> and I, and I like, I go on and on about it. I don't even know how, how long I was in there, but it was probably like a solid, like 10, 15 minute explanation. And, um, and I just remember like this, like jovial, exasperated, like exasperated look. And, and he let he did let me finish. Uh, and then like, after all of it, he says, listen, like sky, you know, you're going to be fine. Like you just gave me a lecture. You're going to do fine. Do it in front of undergraduates. You know, just get out of here. And that was the end of it. And I was like, at first it didn't, I, I, I was like, I wasn't very satisfied with, with the answer that he gave me. But like, when I look back on it, um, there was like a confidence that he had in me, I guess, from the whole performance of, of lecturing to him. Um, and, and it, and it really is like my most fond memory of him. Like I, I, um, I just, I think about like that look on his face as I was talking and just like, Oh my God, like, please stop. Like, you're going to be fine. You're already prepped. Um, but it was just that, that confidence that made you feel like you could do it. And, um, and, and it was, it was impactful to me. It really was. It, it reassured me um, when I did get into the classroom I, and, and as I've continued on, I've, I've thought about that more than once, truly like, um, like it, it's popped into my brain. 
um, that moment with him and that expression of confidence and uh, was, was more impactful than just a few lines you would think would, would end up being on a person's life, but it was, it was cool. It was a cool moment for me. So Sky, as you are not done with your professional career yet and uh, have a long way to go, but think about kind of all of, all of the things that you've done thus far in your career. What are you most proud of? Um, well, thank you for asking that question. Um, my wife and I are both professors. We work in the same unit and we founded the same research group. And that is so cool. Like, uh, it's like the, it's like the magical unicorn, the, the joint hire, same unit, uh, situation. And, and we got that here at OSU and, um, I'm really proud of that. Like, I'm proud that we, we get to have, like, we're, we're the coolies and, and the, that's how everybody refers to us at, at OSU. <laughs> like, we're like this common commodity and, uh, it's really, it's both, it's rewarding. It's fun. And we've gotten to grow together personally and professionally. And it's really been amazing. I, we built a research group, the Mesa group. I'm very, very proud of it. Uh, I started this with my buddy, Robert Hink. Um, and, and we were, you know, really just doing grunt work for the military for a few years. And now, you know, we built a very successful um, grant funding applied research group that, that we're able to go out and, and, and really make genuine impact. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is that right now in the SMSC at OSC, we've got just a really cool group of faculty. We've got um, senior faculty. They're very supportive. We've got a young group of, of with Asia and I, I think we've got like seven basically junior faculty members all working together, doing research proposals together, working on projects together, brainstorming regular, like once a week, I meet more than that, really. I meet with my colleagues to talk about work that we're doing. And, and I'm proud of the fact that we're all friends um, and we're growing together and we've got a really fun unit and it's, it's just been cool. And so uh, all of those things. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, it is. Like, I mean, we're in a really cool spot. I, um, just having people with common interests. One of the things that Dean, uh, Glenn Crutz does is they, they're big on the cluster hire. So you end up getting people that, you know, have like either the same research interest or same methodological background. And so we've just added like really quality pieces, but, but that aren't disjointed from one another. So it hasn't been a whole lot of work in terms of building the cooperative capacity. Like everybody wants to work together and it's just cool. Like it's really fun. But yeah. Very so cool. I feel like we could talk to you for another two hours and I totally um, misstepped here and didn't say, Sky, clear your calendar for <laughs> two and a half hours. Um, so we want to just ask you a final question here. Mm -hmm. um, I know in many cases, travel and conferences and in-person stuff has come to a screeching halt. So I was wondering, even though this has been super fun and exciting, we always like to end on a happy note. Um, is there a conference that you're looking forward to attending in person or a place that you're looking forward to going in person? Absolutely. So um, we have got a number, like I think almost all of our faculty, uh, our junior faculty has something accepted at, uh, at ICA in Paris. Uh, we've got a couple of students that are going to get to come with us. Uh, Kelly Norton and Ellie Melro have um, has spent a lot of time working with the Mesa group. They actually got their own research uh, accepted and uh, at ICA. So they get to come to Paris with us. And I'm really excited about just being with all my, my colleagues in uh, in France. I've, I've got a lot of fond memories of, of Paris. And then being able to take some of our students that have worked with us and this being kind of like the capstone of their graduate experience with us is, is sort of signing off with a, a trip to Paris. We've already bought them berets oh, and, uh, and everybody, everybody's ready. Right. So uh, it should be really fun. Really, really looking forward to that. And to see, you know, all of our other uh, friends from, you know, really all over the U S that, um, you know, are, are out doing the academic game now and getting to see them. Cause like you say, we've been on lockdown for the last couple of years. So it'd be nice to, you know, get out and be back in the world again with people. Well, uh, not, not to, Spoil anything, but um, or we'll we'll have to get on your itinerary because we are going to plan hope for a uh, revised resubmit um, podcast guest get together over there in Paris. Fantastic! Well, I will be there if you let me know where it is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>
Sky, it has been so much fun catching up with you. This has been so great. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. And thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Bissell and Annalisa. It was very nice to meet you as well. Um, And stay in touch and I'll see you in Paris. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone.